Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another podcast and or YouTube video on Gaudium at Spes 22 podcast and video. And I'm very, very happy to once again welcome back my former colleague at DeSales University, Dr. Rodney Hauser. The uh, veteran listeners to my show have heard Hauser blathering and bloviating for many, many episodes now. Uh, but I made the decision a while back that it would be great if I had like a my Ed McMahon, a sort of sidekick on a more regular basis. So uh, and a lot of the I think the more interesting podcasts have a sort of feature like that. So hopefully Rodney will be on here a lot more. Anyway, Rodney, for those who don't know, uh, is the chair of the, at least for now, of the Department of Theology and Philosophy at DeSales University, my former place of employment, which is in the Lehigh Valley near Allentown, Pennsylvania. Rodney got his doctorate at Marquette University in the theology of Hans Urs von Balthasar. What year? 99? 2000? 99. 99. Yeah. Five years after mine. And you're like five years younger than I am. So it's, it's you're, you're just a, you're a, you're a mere pup a mere pup anyway uh so anyway well uh, we're gonna have a little church chat today we're gonna we're we're gonna talk about special church issues uh so i i've gotten emails from a lot of people saying oh i don't like it when you talk about all these intra-ecclesial issues they don't really concern me all that much uh and then i get other emails from emails obviously people say yeah that we need more of that stuff and less of the dense theology stuff like with cyril o'regan and whatnot uh uh but so you know there's no please in every Everybody. But to those people who say you don't like the intra ecclesial, what some people call inside, Chris Altieri calls inside baseball church chat, um, the fact is these things matter. Uh, and otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about them. I'm not a gossip, at least I'd like to think I'm not a gossip. Uh, and these things don't interest me beyond the full uh, signs of the times that we are actually called as a church to discern. And if our task is to evangelize the world, we have to know first what the world is, what it's about, what the signs of those times are, and therefore what the church should be doing. And in my estimation, the church isn't doing what she should be doing. Uh, and, and so those are some of the things we need to talk about. So along those lines, um, Dr. Hauser is actually writing a guest blog post for me, which should be up on Thursday or Friday, uh, the 15th, 16th, 17th, whatever that is, on the uh, recent essay by Cardinal McElroy in America magazine on, uh, you know, the synodality, radical inclusion, open table. He doesn't call it this, but it's essentially open table fellowship uh, at, for, the, for the Eucharist, that anybody can receive the Eucharist and so on. So I'm looking forward to that. So that let, we're going to talk about that here today, at least for starters. So um, let, let's begin then. I'm going to turn it over to you, Hauser, because uh, people hear me enough. Uh, what, what just sort of what is your general impression of the McElroy essay, why do you think he, he wrote it when he did, and what what issues do you have with it? Hmm. Wow, I mean that's a lot. I mean you can pick. Yeah, no, no, we, we'll, we'll pick. Yeah, we'll pick apart some of those things as we go. But um, you know, uh, right out of the gate, it seems to me that um, I mean, obviously, you know, different cardinals are you know sending things out there right now because they would like to go to the synod to go in certain ways. And um, I mean, the Germans have made literally no bones about where they wanted to go. And I was a little bit surprised to hear an American cardinal so forthrightly, um, you know, uh, really, in a sense, echo what the German synodal path wants, uh, maybe in a slightly toned down way. But really, you know, in the, the, along the same lines, changing church teaching on homosexuality, changing church teaching on uh, women's ordination you know, putting those things at least on the table for change. Um, and it's, it's, it was especially surprising given Pope Francis's recent comments, you know, to the German bishops, like this is not what this is about, that we're not, we're not having a synod to, to rediscuss settled matters of doctrine and things like that. Um, so I think it might've been strategic because I think what Cardinal uh, McElroy might be doing is almost responding to Pope Francis's rebuke to the Germans by saying, well, these matters are still open though. These aren't settled matters of church doctrine. And so I think I, I think that's where he's coming from. Um, you know, the problem there, and, and we could just start with 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 some of the problems is the the, the implication or the the overall gist of the thing is to say, if we have more dialogue, we'll simply have more diversity of opinions, 
right? So the, it's a call for right. big tent Catholicism. And right now we've been restrictive and those in the church who want gay marriage and those who want women priests and stuff like that, we're not listening to them uh, or, or whatever. Um, what we see in the culture at large in the United States, however, especially from the elite culture in the United States, however, is not actually more diversity of thought on these matters. What you see is absolute hegemonic uh, propaganda about one way of thinking about these things. And if you are on a university campus these days and you don't agree with the general consensus of the, you know, the uh, corporate media and, and, you know, and the managerial yeah, elite, yeah. you better keep your head down and your mouth closed. So, so I think that's the first thing I would just want to say is that yeah. it, it seems to me a bit disingenuous to act as if what we're going to get out of all of this, if we go down this path, is greater dialogue and greater. And what you're going to get is exactly what you're getting in the mainline Protestant churches and in the culture at large. And that is yeah. one way you're allowed to talk about other these things. Other, otherwise, you're a hater. Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that'd be my first. Well, well, yeah, well, okay, we'll stop there because I want to yeah. comment on that because yeah. I, you know, I'm a certain age and uh, you're just slightly younger where, you know, I grew up in the post Vatican II environment. I was actually in the seminary during the sort of 78 to 86 through the very beginning of John Paul's pontificate. And the fact of the matter is uh, this language of dialogue, inclusion, diversity, uh, let's not be rigid. This is not new. Uh, these are all and I'm not saying necessarily that we're using the words in the same way, but these were the same words that were used by uh, liberal theologians and bishops in the 1960s and 70s and early 80s uh, to describe uh, the church that they wanted. And it was a church where basically there are no sexual sins outside of, uh, you know, sins against consensual sex, right? You know, rape and that sort of thing. Otherwise, there's no such thing as sexual sin. And if it is a sin, it's venial. And you see McElroy say this, right? Why do we have to treat every act of sex outside of marriage as grave matter? So a lot of these things are just venial. That's exactly what they were saying in the 70s. Yeah. Okay. And, and the, at the same time, even in the 70s, there was a sort of it wasn't as strong as today, but even then there was, well, we need to take a look again at homosexuality in, in light of this and so on. And those of us who lived during that period of time understand that when they say dialogue, they don't mean it. Uh, what they mean is we're going to talk and talk and talk to keep the door open to our point of view in the church. We're going to keep the pot stirring by dialogue. We're going to keep these ideas circulating, a kind of perichoresis of liberal ideas going on in the church. And then when we finally have our moment in the right pope, we're going to seize that moment. And when that happens, all dialogue stops. Just ask any seminarian from that period, what's the most fearful thing you could have been called? Rigid. Rigid simply meant you believe what the church taught. So here's my number one problem with, with McElroy, and, and then I'll turn it back over to you, was that when he says things like this, and as you said it yourself, you go into the, the academic world, you go into the corporate world, you cannot, you cannot dissent from these issues without losing your job, seriously, losing your job. And in some cases, like if you're in Canada or the UK, actually being prosecuted. Uh, yeah. and, and, and for crimes, hate crimes. So my yeah. point is that when McElroy, when the McElroy's of the church come out with statements like this, they do not have the backs of faithful Catholics. In fact, they are actually putting faithful Catholics in jeopardy. They are harming faithful Catholics because then uh, a university uh, oversight board or a corporate uh, HR office can say, well, you're claiming that you are just basing your comments on gayness, on your faith. But look at what one of this member, these members of your own church has said. Obviously, you know, Pope Francis made him a cardinal. Obviously, this is a legitimate opinion in the church. So we just think you're being a bigot. So you don't have a leg to stand on at that point. Yeah. OK, you can quote the catechism out the wazoo, but you've got all these Catholic voices from high, high places, one very favored by the pope, apparently McElroy saying, Oh, yeah, this is all venial stuff, you know, get over it. So anyway, that's my sort of take on this dialogue, inclusion, big tent. They don't mean it. They don't mean it. Or they mean we want our way. And when we get our way, you're toast <laughs> yeah. and we don't yeah. and we don't care about it. So anyway, what what are the thoughts do you have on, on the McElroy? I call it the McElroy manifesto. Yeah, I mean, it's not I mean, it's it's it's, it's interesting that we're talking about this because you know, at the beginning, you were saying that some people don't want to hear about, you know, kind of insider baseball about church stuff. They want to hear more theological stuff and then some or vice versa. But the fact of the matter is the two are totally connected. I mean, deeply it, it, interrelated. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, you know, sometimes in his letters, Paul is dealing with, you know, really inter ecclesial sorts of squabbles, but he then he goes into a great big exegesis of, uh, you know, Genesis and Exodus and, you know, and, and, well, and could and, there and, could there have been a more intra ecclesial squabble than whether or not new members of the church had to be circumcised <laughs> or not? Yep, that's about as ecclesial as it can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the average Roman pagan who at that time didn't have the slightest interest in Christianity. Yeah. You know, if you start preaching the faith to somebody in Athens or someplace, that's not going to be the first question they're going to ask. Yeah. Right? Now, what about this circumcision thing? Right. But, but so, and Paul he, talks about that in Galatians then. He sure, out. absolutely. Yeah. And we could get to that. I would like to just one other thing I kind of want to pick up about the McElroy thing in the light of kind of where we are as a, as a culture and things like that is, um, it seems to me that the word inclusion has we and, and even like the word we really have to be careful sort of what we mean by these words because if you just throw them out there they're so vague they can mean anything right so th the fact of the matter is dialogue with the world is going to be a very complicated thing depending on the circumstances you're talking about there, there's no generic thing called the world the world always has concrete manifestations right so let's say i'm a Christian right now in Putin's Russia. What what does dialogue with the world look like for me? You know what I mean? Does it yeah. mean like, oh, we yeah. have to, we don't want to make Putin fear bad about himself. You know, we we don't want to come across as heavy handed or, or something like that. What does dialogue with the world look like if you're Solzhenitsyn during the Soviet regime? You know, and what does it look like if you're in a coffee shop in Manhattan and there's a goth girl with a nose ring sitting across from you? OK, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's you know, an like, entirely different dialogue. <laughs> That's exactly right. Right. So so the point that I'm making is what it seems to me always is meant when we talk about dialogue with the world is dialogue with the secular liberal West. Right. And then yes. what it means is, is it really means some sort of compromise or accommodation. Right. As soon as you bring up a regime that's obviously not on the side of the angels, all of a sudden dialogue with the world is going to look different. And this is why Gaudium et Spes, when it talks about discerning signs of the times and openness to the world, it always qualifies it to say in the light of the gospel. That's right. So our dialogue with the world, in other words, and then I'll just make one other point about this and, and, and kind of be done with it, is not an open-ended Thing that just like we're all yeah. everything's always endlessly up for grabs and there's something that dc schindler says about liberalism in his book that you and i both love and we've talked about this is liberalism is in a sense the reversal of the priority of act and potency right so yeah. so that for aristotle there's there's the there's the there's the fullness of being which would be the fullness of truth goodness and beauty which is a state of pure actuality and everything else is in a state of potentiality towards that so all true dialogue in an Aristotelian or a Catholic framework, it seems to me, it means that we are all in a state of potency vis-a-vis -vis the truth. Dialogue is in the truth, and it's, and, it's, yeah. and it's always towards the truth. What happens in liberalism is you simply get rid of any category of objective truth whatsoever. You either say it doesn't exist, or you say we don't have any access to it. So it's just potency turtles all the way down. It's potency, which means it's ever, ever greater emancipation from any restrictions on my freedom that's right it's it's it right so i that's was just right. watching a really disturbing video that somebody sent to me where a guy was talking to a group of students in oregon about uh queer theory okay and he was asking them questions he said do you know what uh you know foucault's position was on pedophilia and they're like that's irrelevant we don't know who cares whatever and he read it very disturbing. Uh, and then there was another famous theorist that I can't, whose name I can't remember right now. And he said, do you know what this woman said about uh, pedophilia? We don't know. We don't know. We don't care. They're kind of, you're a homophobe. They were already shouting at him because they knew that he was going to read <laughs> very disturbing passages. And yeah. then Judith Butler actually has some very disturbing passages in her books about incest and, and pedophilia. Yeah, sure. And he's, he said, look, I'm not trying to be a jerk here. What I'm trying to show you is Queer theory is precisely about transgressing boundaries. As soon right. as you've transgressed one boundary, you must immediately begin championing the group that's still within a boundary. And, and that's exactly, so that's what I mean by a kind of open- And what is the boundary? It's not just the stipulations of certain moral laws 
uh, of religions. It's the natural law. And it can be anything. Yes. In well, nature, well the, the, the point is, the, the, the point whatever. I'm making is that really the only it is a rash. You know, basically, it's a rational. It's a rational morality rooted in objective goods grounded in the natural law. That's the only valid boundary, because all all other sorts of purely uh, sort of divine diktat, divine command, sort of it's in the Bible. Therefore, it's it's yeah. right or wrong. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. I, 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 I could not agree more with that. It's about boundary transgression. And yeah. I am going to disagree with one thing you said, which is <clears throat> and, I, and, I'm, and I know what you mean, so I'm not really disagreeing where you said words like inclusion and dialogue are so vague yeah, in some ways. Yeah. And they're intentionally vague. Yeah. So as not to be able to be pinned down with a aha, I told you so. But in reality, you and I both know that words like dialogue and inclusion are not vague. They are code. And you identified it. It's code for accepting a compromise with Western secular culture, especially Western secular sexual revolution culture and the whole sort of domain of uh, transgressing boundaries. That's what it is code for. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, would you have ever seen even a more liberal bishop in the Catholic Church pushing transgenderism? Uh, uh, for, anyway, so the, so the point then is, is, is that yeah, it really is about all the sexual stuff, which is why really after McElroy nods in the direction of, well, we have these excluded people who are, you know, immigrants and racial minorities. But then the whole rest of his piece is about we're taking sex way too seriously. So let's just have everybody come up to communion and forget all this sex stuff. All right. So in, in, in reality, that's uh, we can see that this is what he means by dialogue and inclusion. And you raised the issue. Would in, in his open table fellowship, Eucharistic table, comprehensive Eucharist for everyone, would would a grand wizard of the KKK be allowed to accept communion in McElroy's cathedral? It, it, even if, he, you know, if he if he came up the aisle dressed in his white sort of grand or red or whatever it is, whatever the grand wizard of the KKK wears, would he be allowed to do so? Um, I don't I don't think so. Would would a knee or just a, a, say a, a bunch of motorcycle gang hate to be stereotyped here, motorcycle gang, neo-Nazi, you know, guys in leather and chains and shit and stuff. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, came walking up the aisle for communion, saying Sieg Heil as they came up. Would, would they be allowed to receive communion? I don't think so. Not in macros. So they don't mean complete open inclusion. They have some very, very harsh things to say about racism, about the environment, about climate change, about misogyny and so on. And I guarantee you that if we ever got the ordination of women via people like McElroy and there was a breakaway in the church because of it, and there would be there'd be a schism that the McElroy's of the world would be the first to say good riddance. We didn't want you at our Eucharistic table anyway. This is what you saw in Anglicanism as well. You know, they said, well, you don't have to go along with the ordination when all of a sudden, bang, if you didn't, you are out, you are out. But anyway, that's my rant in, in response to what you were saying. Um, yeah. So let, let, let's come back then to, to the McElroy piece uh, just yeah. just a bit, because he does use the language. This this troubles me, too. And it's I, I know, you know, I you listen to James Martin, for example, and he says you, you should always refer to people by what they prefer to be referred to as it's rude not to. And so mm -hmm. Cardinal McElroy uses the language of LGBT. You know, I can't remember. Yeah. He also adds the Q, but he mm -hmm. talks about the LGBT community, which is already nauseated, in my opinion, too, because it's such a misuse of the term community. But OK, I'll stipulate there's a community there. What does it mean? And I say this in my Catholic World Report thing. What does it mean for the church to be radically inclusive towards a bisexual man, let's say. What does that mean? Yeah. Does it mean that if a, if a bisexual man is married but has a gay lover on the side, that the church is supposed to just say, OK, that's great. You're bisexual. You were born that way. That's your orientation. So we have to uh, we don't want to make a distinction between orientation and expression, as McElroy says in his essay, because that puts really burdensome, oppressive weights on people. So, OK. We, we, we have to accept, accept a, a bisexual man and his wife and his gay lover uh, to the Eucharist. Is that, is that the new norm? Is that what we're doing here now? Or what about yeah. transgender? 
I, I mentioned in my Catholic World Report in our church here at the ordinary parish I attend, there was a very, there was a very nice man, a little bit strange. He sang in our choir and he started lecturing. Then all of a sudden he shows up to lecture one day and he gets up out of the pew and he goes up to the lectern and he's he's wearing uh, you know women's clothes and he's got a, a, a long black jet black wig on. And he's got makeup on and stuff. And he and we're all like taken aback. And you know, so our pastor, very, very compassionate man, talked to this guy after mass and said, look, you're very welcome in our parish. We're here to love you and support you and help you in any way we can. We don't judge you, but you may not, you may not lecture here anymore dressed in drag. You can't yeah. do that because it confuses kids. Uh, our parents don't want their kids to see this kind of thing. It's confusing. And, and you know, guy left the parish. So yeah. what, what, as I say in my Catholic World Report, what would be Cardinal McElroy's response to that? To, to let the, to turn mass into drag queen holy hour, you know, that we're just supposed to let anybody dress any way they want. At the lectern, you know, a dude with a beard can dress as a woman and that's OK. Yeah. Um, so any, these are all questions I'm raising about this yeah. acronym that McElroy uses, LGBT. Sure. Right. <laughs> and what does so, it mean in the big picture for us to be radically inclusive to the whole kaleidoscope there of sexual preferences? Right. And this is something that I think is fascinating, chap, about this whole thing. And it's really coming out in the last, I guess, 10 years, you know, since the <clears throat> since the ball really got rolling on this stuff. But but, yeah. the, but the issue is what we're beginning to realize is the limits of the logic of liberalism, right? That that liberalism sort of has this thing to each his own. And we thought yeah. that would work, that, that it, you could just basically privatize just about everything <laughs> under the sun and still kind of live together in a world. And you know, it's already the Frankfurt School is, is critiquing this in the in the fifties. This kind of individualist logic and 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 this in this notion, um, which Hor Horkheimer, Adorno, or others, yeah, yeah, you name it. I mean, dialectics of enlightenment. You know, yeah, yeah, it, okay. You know, it's in there. Um, but what's kind of interesting is they realize, and this is where you start to get the politics of identity. Uh, Charles Taylor has some good stuff stuff on this, but it's basically yeah. like it's not enough for a person, let's say, who has a homosexual orientation to be left alone that, that was the first step right did you hey you you know you let me be me and i'll let you be you and that's you know that's kind of how this works that obviously wasn't enough for the lgbt community because of, very very quickly then as soon as they were given you know kind of more tolerance and acceptance there was now an advocacy to be celebrated right and and it was brought out now what sort of then has to happen in a liberal culture which is kind of now moving in this more, what I would call advanced liberal direction, you know, kind of more aggressive liberalism, liberalism more as a worldview and as a kind of a, a, a competing Catholicity, I think Balthazar would call it, um, yeah. is, is you see it already, we're having the problem in schools is that they're putting literature in the schools. Uh, they, there are some schools that have invited uh, um, trans people in to give talks to yeah. the kids. And it's all in the name of helping the kids not to have homophobia and transphobia and stuff like that. But of course, any traditional Muslim, traditional Catholic, traditional Baptist, traditional Orthodox Jew, you know, whatever, whose, whose kids are going there are going to be like, I don't want you guys indoctrinating. I'm willing to allow you to do what you want in your bedroom, but I don't want you indoctrinating my children. But it always has to come to that because we do have to live together as a people. And this is where I think McElroy is also either naive or, or he's being or he's being somewhat evil. Um, and that is that you pretend that the church can, quote, be big enough for these kind of disagreements. So we can have a church where German Catholics marry gay people and African Catholics don't. But this underestimates the degree to which we really do need to be unified in order to go forward. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. one group is going to get the preaching against and the other group is, I mean, you can never avoid the problem. That's why the early church with the question of circumcision had to settle the damn thing. They, they couldn't just say, well, we'll let some church require it and some churches not. That, yeah. That's not unity and faith and love. That's chaos. Because, and this is key, yeah. the issue was not really circumcision. The issue was the status of all of those sort of holiness code mosaic laws. Yep, yep. And Paul realized that if you require circumcision, the next thing is requiring all the Levitical laws for everything okay. else. Yep. And he and he had an entirely different theological vision for yes. which parts of the Old Testament were still, in a sense, part of the new covenant and which because they were eternal. 
uh, where, whereas which there were parts of the old covenant which were preparatory and provisional. Mm -hmm. uh, they were preparations for Christ. Well, Christ is here and we no longer do them like the dietary laws and so on. Yep. So in other words, the circumcision thing was the tip of a, of a, a much deeper theological iceberg. And right. the same here. Yeah. The same here. You yes. show me a cardinal. And this is why I, I don't trust him. All right. And why I don't trust. A, oh, he's just calling for dialogue. What's wrong with dialogue? Because. All right. It's the tip of a deeper iceberg. You show me a prelate who says we need to allow for gay sex and for married gay men and women to come to communion. We need to allow for divorce and remarried people to come to communion. We need open table fellowship. We need women priests. All right. And I will show you a prelate that has a completely different vision of theology than what the church does. All right. Yeah. yeah. That that he's speaking the language of like you, you said before about a, a, it's a competing Catholicity. This is not the same faith. Uh, yeah. once given to the apostles and to our fathers. It's not, it's a different faith. No, uh, that's absolutely brilliant. That's absolutely exactly it, I think. I mean, we already have the mainline Protestant churches to prove this, that, that it's not just that the mainline Protestant churches allow for openly gay people to attend church and openly gay pastors and things like that. The mainline Protestant church has become indistinguishable from left secular liberalism absolutely indistinguishable in everything. So I, th I think you make a brilliant point there that this seems like it could be a minor issue, but that's not how it's played out historically. This <laughs> issue has been the tail that wags an entire theological dog that is simply yeah. the absolute conformism. But this leads me to another point later that I think is, we're, 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 uh, which is super interesting about, about um, Galatians and circumcision and kind of all of that stuff. Um, I've been thinking about this. Well, we in the office of readings last week, we were reading the, you know, the letter to the Galatians. And I was like, man, this Paul is like really urgent. I mean, there's something urgent going on here. And here, here's the deal, chap. If you think about it, you, you come through the Jerusalem council and they make this very radical decision that they're not going to require Gentiles to be circumcised, which you're absolutely right. That is a whole theological thing goes with that. They were Judaizers, right? right? Yeah, that, that's and right. The I mean, I don't mean that in an anti-Semitic no, 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 way. I mean, no, that's no. what Paul caused no. them, right? right? Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, precisely, right? So it brings with it a whole different understanding of the relationship between law, grace, blah, 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 all this stuff. But here's what's interesting. You come out of the other end of the council. You finally get the Jerusalem council to assert that Gentiles won't have to be circumcised. They won't have to observe kosher diet, um, et cetera. But they do require two things. And this is just interesting, right? They require that the Gentiles are not allowed to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Right. And then their other thing they're not allowed to do is engage in, quote, pornea. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, if, if you know anything you know about this, but not everybody does, um, pornea is an umbrella term that usually gets translated as sexual immorality. And I was doing some research on this recently, and I found out the, no. reason, the, the reason for that is it is it translates about 10 different words in the Old Testament for various kinds of shenanigans, from prostitution to cult prostitution to homosexual prostitution. It's, I mean, to, to adultery, uh, you know, et cetera. It has, it's, a, it's an umbrella term. which To invalid that. incestuous marriages and that sort oh, of thing. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Concubinage. Yes. Those yes. Sc Scott Hahn makes this point in the Ignatius... Oh study bible that oh, okay. or I, I often simply meant invalid marriages to your to your first cousin and stuff like that <laughs> right right <clears throat> but here's what's interesting if cardinal mcelroy is right and the sexual sins really aren't that important why would the jerusalem council in the very first decision by right. a church imposed on all churches mention sexual immorality and here's my thing about this no guy. idolatry no sexual shenanigans and why are these two things? I'm trying to think of that through. And it's and, and, and why is Paul so urgent about these things when he writes his various letters? These are the things that are going to keep the Gentiles from being absorbed back into the pagan world. They're going to be right. distinguished from the world by their higher sexual ethic, which they inherit from Judaism, and the fact that they don't engage in idolatry. And this is why Paul is not abolishing the law. Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law, but fulfill it. Jesus actually makes the law more difficult because he turned Bingo. it up. 
don't look at the anything. Sermon on the Mount. It you makes things harder, lot. not easier. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. He's like, unless your righteousness exceeds the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? So it's now I about, can't even look at a woman with lust. I, I know, right? <laughs> that exactly. Dad, it. I know. Come on, right? So, so the point then would be not that I do, by the way. <laughs> right. Even, the point ahead. would be that if the Gentiles that in the churches are now going to go back out into the streets and go to these festivals where they're eating meat sacrificed to idols. That right. means that they're returning to their idolatrous ways. If they go back into these situations, by the way, there's going to be prostitutes at these festivals. And if they're sleeping with these prostitutes, they're back to their idol. There's an infidelity, not to, it's not a private sin and that you do in the closet. It's a sin against God. That's the yeah. key. Yeah. David, when he sins with Bathsheba, he writes that psalm, of course, that we all know about. He says, against you and you only have I sinned. He's talking to God. Yeah, yeah. Our that's sins are good. against God. And, that's the, you know, and oh, there's a minor. Yeah. And what McElroy is calling for is, this, is for the church to simply uh, take on the ways of pagan America, of techno-pagan, you know, America. That's and it. One of the things that, uh, so, so by the way, before I get on to, you know, obviously then, you know, Paul wants to emphasize we are a priestly people. And I always talk about this. You know, the Israel was a nation set apart. Yeah. And even though the church breaks down the barrier, Jew and Gentile, the converts to the Christian faith are now expected to follow Christ. And we are now still as a church, a people set apart, a holy That's people, right. a righteous right. priesthood. A priesthood is that which mediates God to the world, the world to God. And, yeah. and therefore, our path is the same path as Christ, as his disciples, the path of vicarious substitution and suffering for the love of the world, for the sake of the world. OK, wow. but that requires us not to live like the world. Yeah, All right. Absolutely. To absolutely. live a higher righteousness than that of the world. Um, right. Now, anyways, I sort of uh, kind of forgot what my next point was going to going to be as, as I was uh, ranting and, and, and raving. But go ahead. So if you well, have that, was a, that was a darn good one. So I'm glad you, you made yeah. that one before you forgot your other one. But but yes. Yeah. So this is, let's take that back to something that you said earlier, which really, really nails it. And that is that. What Paul and the early dis apostles seem to understand is that if we allow the Gentiles to return to their former ways of life in these uh, allegedly trivial areas, like going to these festivals and eating meat sacrificed to idols yeah. and go visiting prostitutes and things like that, that don't seem like they really do that much damage. What it does is it disables the church to come out of the world for the sake of the world, Right. So, and, and something you said earlier, um, if, if we go to the mainline Protestant churches, it was in all of, in every single case, it seems to me, it began with a rejection of a particular sexual teaching. First contraception, uh, then it was uh, divorce and remarriage, then yeah. it was gay marriage and gay sex, uh, and now- well, An abortion, abortion. <laughs> They, oh, abortion. They, they, yes, they're, they're all in favor of legal abortion, even though they kind of frown upon it. Right. Uh, you know, so, it's so, yeah, they're all for it. That's right. So if you think about what the mainline Protestant churches do, uh, they really just rubber stamp whatever Democratic uh, liberals want. And of course, yes. we know that you've written about this enough and we can we might as well mention it while we're talking about it. There's a, there's, of course, a certain kind of conservative liberal that does the exact same thing with the Republican Party. You know, while the popes are 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 lighting their hair on fire to tell us not to invade Iraq, there are American Catholics who are saying, "Oh no, it's a it's a just war." Why? Why? Because we're in bed with the you know the world in in, in these. So there's other ways you can violate this. We don't want to imply that the only way to you know violate this thing, of course, is sex. It, you know, we, it can be about greed. It can be about immigration. It can be about war. Um, but this is one area that is important, though, the sex stuff. It, it's not either or. You know, and this is this is an important point, because obviously, as a Catholic worker myself, I believe yeah. strongly in the teachings of Dorothy Day. And therefore, I have a very strong affection for what we call the seamless garment of life yes. you know, ethic. And so I, and it's, therefore, we have to be concerned not just with sexual matters, but with poverty and war you know, all, all, you know, injustices of all kinds. And I mean that, mean that sincerely, yeah. but yeah. it does seem, and it comes out in the McElroy piece, right. Uh, and, and among others from like Cardinal Supich and others have made comments along these lines, which is, can we just sort of get over, you know, the sex stuff a little bit? In other words, 
in in, in emphasis and once again, it's code. So they want to emphasize all these other issues and they say, oh, I'm not going against the church's teaching on sexuality. I just want to round that out by making sure that we talk about all these other things, too. Well, you know, newsflash, we do talk about all those other things, too. It's not as if the church has been mute on those things. It's just that, believe it or not, people fixate on the sexual things because that really hits. In other words, it doesn't hit home to me too much as to how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. It doesn't hit home to me too much, even though it should, uh, whether there's slave labor in the lithium mines, you know, in in Africa and Asia and so forth. All of those things do concern me, but they don't have the visceral impact, right? That that, that sexual matters often do. And, and, you know, when a married couple says, oh, I'm, I'm not allowed to contracept or one spouse is caught being unfaithful or whatever, all right? The sexual sins, are, are an, an expression of, of sort of the day to dayness of our lives. And, yeah. and there, there is a certain shame associated with sexual sins. Uh, mm-hmm. C.S. Lewis wrote about this. All right. That, yeah. That's good. Actually, we should yeah. have shame over our sexual sins. So my fear when this push by McElroy and others in the speaking as a seamless garment of life guy, my fear is that this is all part of a move to simply as you say, buy into or the, you know, the pagan American culture yes. and to simply do away. I mean, if you read the McElroy essay, I mean, l- let's face it, what he's talking about is doing away with sexual sins. I mean, yeah. pure and simple doing away with, because if you open the communion table to anyone who's committed any sexual sin of any kind, other than sort of criminal sexual sins that involve violence and so on. Right. Then you're, what are you saying? I mean, like yeah. take the divorce and remarried. The divorce and remarried can now come to communion. Well, you might as well then dissolve every marriage tribunal that handles annulments anywhere in the world, right. because the, the 99.9% of people that say, and I have an annulment, right, from my first marriage. The reason why you seek an annulment is because you, you want to be able to receive the Eucharist, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not just that, oh, I don't want to be in an adulterous relationship. I, I want in a second invalid marriage. I want to be. In the Eucharist. All right. And insane. And the thing is, insane to such a person. Say if the church had said to me 25 years ago when I got my annulment, oh, don't worry, you, 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 you could. And I had priests who say this to me. Oh, just don't worry about any of that. Just get married and come up for communion anyway. Is that not tantamount to say that the church is wrong to demand annulments? Is that not tantamount to saying that second marriages are not contrary to our Lord adultery? Right. Because you don't allow adulterers. Right. I don't imagine Cardinal McElroy wants adulterers, especially like uh, a man with a mistress, for example, cheating on his pregnant wife like Donald Trump did. Okay, Mm -hmm. having sex with, you know, porn stars, apparently Uh, you save the hate mail, folks. Okay, I know there's a people who love Donald Trump out there, but that's a fact. Donald Trump cheated on his wife when she was pregnant. Now, would sure. Cardinal McElroy be OK with that? Should should assuming Trump had been Catholic? Oh, come on up for communion, sir. That's no big deal because sexual sins are no big deal. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's, no, it's, I mean, it's absolutely mind boggling. What in other words, what people don't do when they read something from McElroy like this, they they focus on words like dialogue, inclusion. What's wrong with that? Yeah. They don't understand that the, the logical entailments in the position, theologically yeah. speaking. And the logical theological entailment of what McElroy is saying is that, is that you can get divorced and remarried. It's not yeah. adultery. So go ahead right. and do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 it's very depressing. And the other thing that's really, really bad about all this, like the, there's a theological principle at stake here. And that is that, um, you know, Catholicism has always been, you know, we all say this all the time, but it really is an important thing to repeat, repeat, repeat. Is, is about both and, right? So, so yeah. orthodoxy is not just a matter of holding certain things. It's a matter of holding certain things in balance, right? So if you think about, to, to go back to like Paul's letter to the Galatians, he's on the one hand, like frothing at the mouth. He's very, very upset. So he's yeah. got a real passion for the truth. He thinks that what they're doing is separating them from Christ. He says he wishes the circumcision party would circ- would castrate, go all the way and castrate themselves. I mean, he's not <laughs> yeah. only punches. In the very same letter, he talks about his motherly love for the Galatians, that he gave birth to them in the faith, that he fed them milk. 
Uh, he longs to see them again. And so you're like, is he bipolar? I mean, like, what's, what's wrong with Paul? No, because both of these are part of the Catholic message. We are both loving, compassionate, pastoral, but we don't mess around with the truth of the gospel. Because you step outside of the truth of the gospel, you become enslaved to something that's going to really hurt you. So that's one thing, right? Now, let's talk about half the church's teaching about poverty and immigration and the environment and things like that. Let's never talk about the sex stuff. no. The early church right, talked about right. both, right? So both. if we're going to yeah. be Catholic, we have to talk about the tough parts of the of the gospel that don't fit in with our culture, and then also talk about some of the things that we will agree with, say, the, the Republican or the Democratic Party, depending which one on, you know what I mean? But we can't just run around talking about half the thing. That was my biggest problem with the McElroy piece. He talks about inclusion and dialogue and the danger. He never, ever talks about the other half of the gospel. And therefore, in a way, he's lying. Yeah, yeah. Mean, it's, it's, it, 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 it's mendacious. It's deceptive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it really, really is. And you hate to say that about, you know, a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Um, yeah. I'm sure if I were to sit down and have a beer with the good cardinal, we would probably have much that we actually did agree upon. And, and he, I mean, he'd be a pleasant man to talk all the all the usual stuff that people say. Sure. about other. Oh, I'm sure he's a good person. And he probably is. Uh, but but the fact of the matter is, is that he's playing a game. Yeah. He's playing a game. Liberals right. have been playing this game in the Catholic Church for 60 years. Yeah, that's what I sort of started with in this segment. It is a game. It's a word game. And right. what it, what the word game is meant to do is to deceive people by using words that everybody agrees are good things like dialogue and inclusion and compassion yeah. and mercy and forgiveness. Yeah. We all agree those are good things, but yeah. then you are using them as code for yeah. a deeper agenda that you are hiding right. and that you're, you, you, you really don't care about any of those words. What you yeah. care about is the sexual revolution right? and the gender revolution. This is what you care about. This is what motivates you. Notice the reason why McElroy doesn't talk about the other half of the gospel, Rodney, is notice what else he doesn't talk about. He doesn't talk about repentance. He doesn't talk about sin. He doesn't yes. talk about conversion. What right. are the first words out of Christ's mouth at the very beginning of the gospel of Mark? Repent, repent, yeah. Yeah. repent, repent, yeah. repent yeah. of what? In McElroy's universe, what would those Jews have to repent of exactly? Uh, right. What were they doing that Christ was so adamant they had to repent of? Uh, you know, I don't know, I guess unkindness to widows or something. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. but yeah, so you get my point that, yes. that, that I agree with you there, there is, there is a deception going on here and it's, it's troubling. They're playing a game. And my question then is, is Pope Francis also playing this game? Hmm. Uh, because as you correctly pointed out, Pope Francis, like in his recent interview with AP news yeah. was critical of the German synodal way. Uh, referred to homosexual actions as sinful and so on. Um, and yet, and he says, he says, all, I had a piece in the National Catholic Register. It's on my blog where I talked about there's a disconnect quite often between Pope Francis's words and his actions. His words are perfectly orthodox. But when you look at what he does, which to me is more important, he has re-empowered all the wrong people in the church. Mm -hmm. He has made Cardinal Holerick of Luxembourg in charge. He's the relator general of the synod. He's on record of saying, well, we need to change the teaching on homosexuality. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. He made Cardinal McElroy a cardinal over, you know, uh, from San Diego. San Diego's never had a red hat, but he went, you know, he didn't want to make some of these other Americans in traditional cardinal at seas, you know, red hats. He gave them the right. McElroy. You know, he's promoted James Martin to a Vatican job. Right. Um, you know, with a stroke of a pen, he could shut down the German synodal way that he says yeah. he hates so much. And yet he hasn't, he right. hasn't done so. so you know, yeah. and he's, you know, he listens to Cardinal Supich. Supich is now on the dicastery for bishops and, mm -hmm. and Supich is not good. Let's just put it that way. So anyway, what, yeah, what's, no, saying, I, what's your yeah, take well, on, on, on Pope Francis' what, role in all of this? Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I think I'll begin by repeating something that you mentioned to me a couple of weeks ago that I, 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 I don't know why I'm so stupid. I hadn't thought of this, but I really think that you nailed it. You said that what uh, 
Francis likes is the pastoral style yes. of the McElroys and the Supiches. It's clear that when he talks about when he, when push comes to shove and he has to come down on the theological issues, he's on the on the side. Actually, he starts to sound like a communio theologian when he begins to talk about these things. I mean, you know, before he became pope, he was very uh, involved in communion and liberation, and yeah. Giussani was very very much involved in the Italian communio. Um, and so when somebody asked him the other, you know, not that long, Pope Francis, that is about why can't women be ordained to the priesthood, his answer was straight up Balthazar. You know, he, he said that, you know, oh, he made a distinction with the Petrine and Mary and functions church, of the church. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I don't for the for a minute think that that's just Pope Francis BS. And he has said that Guardini is a great uh, yeah, yeah, theologian no, that he right. admires. I think, I'll, I'll, but here is, I think the, the 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 danger, and I don't think it's that Pope Francis is evil or he's trying to you know ruin the church or anything. I really think there's a naivete there. Yeah, and I don't think he understands how. I think he's actually maybe even been surprised to some degree how much within the Roman Catholic Church since the Second Vatican Council there has been an entire faction. That simply doesn't even accept in huge swaths of the faith. And they and the reason they don't is because they thought the Second Vatican Council was the beginning of the liberalization of the church. And then when that turned out, like when they wrote the Dutch Catechism, you know, Paul VI was like, da, this is not acceptable. I think they were like, what? I thought we were all going to become liberals now, right? So what happened yeah. to those people during the papacies of John Paul II and Benedict? Is they sort of went underground, or they went to universities where you can get they away. They became with they became theology professors. They became theology professors at subversive universities, Catholic or yeah. otherwise, and they got where they kept the flame burning. That's right, they did, and and it. I mean, you were at Fordham, I was at Marquette. The flame was burning. We were oh, reading. Yeah. We were reading. Oh, geez, right. yeah. John Paul and title. Benedict did not change we, the universities at all. We, not yeah, one we bit. Allowed to read Benedict and, and Ratzinger, right? So here, here's the thing. Oh, the trouble I had getting a Balthazar dissertation through at Fordham. It was amazing. Right. Thank right. God for the late great Ed Oakes being there. Right. So I think what is happening right now is because Pope Francis has, has, has underestimated sort of what the buzzword dialogue means, and he kind of then trots it out, too. I think he literally genuinely means a kind of getting together within the truth of the faith and, and seeing, you know, wh where are we going, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the out of the woodwork, all of a sudden comes all of these underground progressives that had bought into a whole different version of Catholicism, in my opinion. I mean, it was it's 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 a totally different version, incompatible with the faith of the church. And now they're just espousing it from the rooftops. Um, and just one other quick point about this yeah. that I think yeah. is, is 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 important. I've been reading uh, Andrew Willard Jones book, The Two Cities, with my integrating seminar this semester. It's been a blast. The kids are they're loving it. They're, they're, they can't they, they can't Great get book. it. Great it's, book. It's, it's unbelievably good. It's so readable, yet it's so brilliant. We need when to have he, him on the show again. Yeah, that was great. That was a very fun show. But one of the things he points out, as you know, Larry, is in the early modern period, the papacy gets radically weakened. And as the papacy gets weakened, the various national churches get stronger and stronger. And each of them kind of develops their own flavor of Catholicism. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, kind of ironically, is they get very heavy handed and they get very controlling. So the Spanish Inquisition is the, is, is a kind of one of the, out, the, the, the byproducts of early modernity. You know what I mean? The, it's where the Spaniards want absolute control over what people are thinking and doing and all that stuff, just like the German Lutherans. Well, and, and to get rid of the Jews and Muslims to have a unified well, Catholic Spain so that the it, crown. So, I mean, much like Constantine, so that the absolutely. crown has this spiritual glue to hold the nation together yes um, because it's, we, it's, we tend to think of modern spain as yeah. this ethnically mono uh, you know homogenous thing and it was a real and it still is to a certain point a real mixture of competing yeah. ethnicities yeah. and spanish right. dialects and so on that's right and they didn't want that so so they didn't what, what what, what you get is as the spiritual power and the spirit, the unifying spiritual power decreases, the temporal power rises up and people begin to think of themselves first as Spaniards, as French, as German. So true British. localism and diversity goes away in early modernity, which is which is totally ironic. Right. Yeah. Right. Here's the, here's the deal. What what uh, the Rhine right of kings was in you know the 17th century is exactly, it seems to be, what liberalism has become in the 20th century. 
It's yeah. also this hegemonic temporal power that tells everybody how to think about everything. And the spiritual power, the unifying power of the church is so weakened that what you've gotten in the church is tribal Catholicisms. There's no unifying Catholicism anymore. Right-wing That's Catholics right. uh, believe in, uh, they, they vote for Trump for God's sake. You know, <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is how bad it's gotten that people, that Catholics think that Trump is like some kind of a saint and he's the most, he's the most un-Catholic person you can practically think of, right? Or, or people are cheering on the Iraq war in spite of the fact that it does probably not meet a single criteria of just war theory, right? Um, right. And then, of course, you get the McElroys who are sidled up to the, you know, the Biden LGBT and people and, out, in, yeah. out in San Francisco. And Biden couldn't can't get enough abortion, apparently, you know, so um, yeah. it, it, it's it's very depressing. And, and, uh, and I don't think Pope Francis has helped as much as he could. I think what John Paul II and Benedict did because of the weakened spiritual unity and all that stuff they were very much teaching evangelical popes they yes. proclaimed the truth of the faith and Larry let's face it those guys didn't come down right or left they came down catholic yeah <laughs> right oh yeah on Absolutely. issue after issue i mean they weren't they weren't which is why them. they're they were hated by both the left and the and the far right the, the traditionalists right. hate well they don't hate but the traditionalists have deep antipathies to john paul and benedict and so do leftists of course but especially yeah. the neocons uh with pope benedict they, oh, did, they yeah. hated the, you know uh caritas and veritate uh and those passages in centesimus anus where john paul ii doesn't sound like a republican they literally added some of those passages out and the, yeah and, and and the 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 paragraph i think 46 47 of space Aldi, where benedict says you know only a few people go to hell yeah, <laughs> more yeah. than likely, it's just a f the vast, vast majority of people, he says, are going to have to go through some purgatory, but they're go they're going to yeah. make it. Uh, yeah, they don't right. they don't like that. And and so that's yeah. not for all of his, uh, you know, Panzer Cardinal right wingness, apparently. Right. That's not exactly a very right wing Catholic perspective, right? No, it's questions of things like war and economics and the environment and stuff. Uh, Benedict and John Paul II both sound like lefties. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, yeah. you, you know, I mean, it's, so that's kind yeah, of my absolutely. Point, is that what sadly yeah. is happening here is that McElroy is giving voice to one half of the truth of Catholicism. And it's the half that fits with left liberalism. But that's not Catholicism. Yeah. And so you see, and I'm, I might be giving Pope Francis the benefit of the doubt precisely because he's pope. And I think to a certain extent, a Catholic should do that. We should steel man the pope's arguments as yeah. specifically Catholic ones, because he is the Pope. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I do think, for example, that the Cardinal Supiches, the Cardinal McElroy's are not naive. I think they have an agenda. I think they know exactly what they want and they yeah. want the church to look like. And now I remember what I was going to say earlier that I forgot. They want the church to look like modern culture because they yeah. actually really and truly believe in the values of modern American, Western European, secular liberalism. They do. I don't think Pope Francis does, but I think they do. Um, yep. And here's the interesting thing. When you, you read things from uh, McElroy and uh, emails that I get from some liberals too, and then read things from like Cardinal Batzing in, in Germany, head of you know, the German Episcopal Conference, they all say something very interesting. And I would ask listeners and, and viewers to pay attention to this whenever you hear it. Every single one of these hyper progressive Catholic leaders will mention at some point, if we don't change our teachings on these issues, we will no longer be relevant as a church and we will dwindle to almost nothing. We will become just this tiny little sect. And in order, therefore, to make sure that that doesn't happen, we need to change these teachings. Well, let me let's just unpack that for us. What if th that is so wrong on a billion different levels, right? First off, it's wrong because, well, the, as you've pointed out over and over today, the Protestants have already gone down that path. We're hemorrhaging people. Well, it must be because we've had we've got incorrect positions on hot button issues. So yeah. if we change our positions on those hot button issues, people will come back. Not right. Right. not the problem right. isn't that the church has unpopular views on hot button issues. The problem is, is that people don't believe this stuff anymore, period. Right. They don't yeah. believe in the Christian evangel. They don't believe Christ rose from the dead. They barely believe in God. You ask, yeah. for example, you go to Germany and you take a poll and ask how many Germans believe in God, and it's about 15 percent. 
It's even less than some other European countries. The fundamental root problem is a de facto atheism and an overt atheism. It's unbelief. And yet here are these liberals like McElroy panting with tongue on the ground after the modern world. You know, as if we need to fill the pews by changing our position on these issues. The, the other thing is that he said, well, there's no what happened to truth? What if we're right and the world is wrong? Right. right. I think, oh, we're going to oh, you know, well, we need to sort of sidle up to Hitler uh, because we want to remain relevant to young Nazi youth. And if we if we go against Hitler, he's going to throw us into concentration camps and we won't be relevant anymore. All right. And then that's then there were churches saying that, which is why you had to have the confessional church, you know. Yeah. So 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 my 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 point sort of in all this is is that there is uh, a real I'm going to say it, it's just a real stupidity. It's a right. monumentally stupid thing to say. And it also points to something for all of their ranting yeah. and arguing against integralism of the yeah. hard right. They're integralists. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they they are exactly. actually they are actually, especially the Germans with the church taxes, they're thirsting after they are lusting after the old Constantinian arrangements yes. of throne and altar. Yeah. Uh, they would like nothing more than for the Church of Germany to simply become, you know, an adjunct of the German state, which it is essentially sure. right now, an adjunct yeah. of the German state. Uh, right. And so that's the irony. They're actually Constantinian integralists but in the yeah. liberal register. That's exactly right. I mean, the, the, again, we have the mainline Protestant churches to look at, right? The mainline Protestant churches are the civil religion of left liberalism. They're, they're nothing but that. Now, what this means, yeah. Chapman, you know this. The NPR that, at prayer. That's exactly right. But, but here's <clears throat> what happens to those churches then. There's always going to be a cadre of people who actually would like to hear the gospel, <laughs> right? Yeah. So they always then quit going to those churches. Once those churches become totally co-opted by uh, the progressive left, the people that still believe in some of the traditional church teachings that are not popular have to have to, of course, break off and start another yet another wing of the Presbyterian church or the Methodist church or Lutheran church. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The super duper reformed Presbyterian yeah. church. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. The still reformed one. Right. And then what happens is the people that still go find out that this church is still somewhat held back by some of the God baggage. It's still some limits. So why not just go to Starbucks on Sunday morning where there's no, yeah. God, like national yeah. public radio has nothing yeah. stopping them from embracing everything. They're nihilists, right? So they can just go as far. The church is always going to be 10 years behind New York times. Yeah. So why bother yeah. with it? <laughs> right. So they, is it, yeah. Yeah. And what it is, is that these guys, they're allowing NPR and The New York Times to define the really real for us. Yeah. I mean, th that's what strikes me so often is that in the minds of these guys, it, it, there's just no, there's there's no argument to be made. There's no question. Well, of course, mm -hmm. the church is wrong on these issues. Of course yeah. they are. Right. And it means that they they haven't there's no self-critical moment here and there's no yeah. critical moment towards American culture. They simply right. buy lock, stock and barrel into the plausibility structures as a sociologist go into the plausibility structures of late modern American left wing culture, secular culture. And, and they think that's what constitutes the really real and, yeah. and truth. And, right. and so the church has to line up with this. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I, yeah, I, I, it's. It's deeply disheartening. So to go back to Pope Francis, you know, yeah. I don't think he thinks that way. I agree yeah. with you. I, I think there is. Um, I'm going to say two things. I think there is. There's a deep naive. It's hard to believe that he could be this naive. It's hard to believe that a man of his rank who spent so much time, you know, in the upper echelons of the church could be this naive about what's really going on. But it kind of seems that he is. Yeah. The other thing I, is I this. Just interject Go one ahead. quick yeah. there, I, yeah. I, I do think that I do think that Pope Francis has been infected by modern liberal thought in a way that neither John Paul II nor Benedict. I had. agree. And that was going to be and, my next point. Yeah. I think their willingness to call this culture a dictatorship of relativism or a culture of death means yeah. that they had a very strong radar about where liberal modernity takes us. I think yeah. Pope Francis thinks it's more benign than that. I'm not saying he's a liberal. I just think he thinks it's more benign. I think, too, 
there is a theological element here. I would I really wonder what Pope Francis's theology of grace is. I wonder if it isn't a certain hyper Ronarian uh, mm. sort of view of, you know, that that grace is always already operative everywhere, which it yeah. is. All right. But so I wonder if, you know, in discerning the signs of the times or the movement of the Holy Spirit, and you see this in the synodal way, um, if Pope Francis isn't just a little too quick to see the movement of the Holy Spirit in just about everything that's taking place in secular culture. In other words, I think Pope Francis has a diminished sense of the distorting effects of sin yeah. in people's lives. And I therefore think he's not very astute at discerning the distorting effects of the zeitgeist. I think he has a tendency to conflate the zeitgeist with the geist, <laughs> the Godgeist, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in overly simplistic ways, rooted in a kind of very homogenized notion of grace is everywhere and pretty much the same in everyone. Right. What, what do you think of that? I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I do think that he has been affected by a certain strain of liberation theology that kind of conflates um, social yeah. justice with eschatology in an overly easy way. And, yeah. uh, and that would be, again, something that would maybe make him different than Benedict or John Paul II, who both definitely wanted to see social justice, preferential option for the poor, et cetera, et cetera, but had some serious, serious misgivings with certain forms of liberation theology that conflated political liberation with liberation from sin. And uh, yeah, yeah. And so, again, I just think that when you're in a culture where the current is going so rapidly that way, if you're not constantly cautioning about that tendency, then you're then you're giving into it. And again, I don't know if Pope Francis knows he's giving into it, but by not talking about these things, these dangers, I think that opens him up to the charge of, of cooperating with the, quote, zeitgeist. I, I agree. Yeah. And uh, I, I wonder, too, if he doesn't have a certain uh, pop, a, a very simplistic populist understanding of, of ordinary people, uh, for example, in his criticisms of the German synodal way, he criticized it essentially for being elitist, that it's mm -hmm. being run by a small few people who are ideologically motivated by a secular ethos or whatever. Now, he's not yeah. wrong about that. That is essentially correct. But I think what he also wants to say, what's sort of implied in that is that they are therefore detached from what the average German thinks. That yeah. they're not represent they're elitist because they're not representative of what the average Catholic German Catholic actually thinks. And yeah. quite frankly, I think they are. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. I think hopefully I think what he kind of means by that is the Germans are elitist, say, vis-a-vis -vis the Africans. And because and, because I think they are. Yeah. And I kind of yeah. think he, I think he was really annoyed at the way they did the Amazonian thing. I think he thought he was going to send them down there and they were going to be open minded to other cultures. And all they did was just down there and try to push in a heavy handed way, a left liberal German agenda on the, the people of the Amazon. But and, the whole and, the whole point behind the Senate was just to get married priests. That, that, exactly, I mean, that, right. It was all just to get married priests and yeah. hopefully also then just ordaining uh, local indigenous married guys you know, right. to, to the priesthood out in their tribal, you know, may not be a bad idea. I'm not saying that it's a horrible idea. All I'm right. saying is you're right. It, the Pope had to be annoyed. Oh, yeah. He, he wanted them to talk more about if you see in his apostolic exhortation, uh, Corina Amazonia, he talks a lot about the environment, the environment yeah. and localism and the need to avoid sure. te technological destruction of, of the environment. And so on. he doesn't okay. talk at all about married priests. And so I think I, I think you're right. I think he is annoyed by that, um, yeah. that movement in the church. So we'll see. I mean, it's it's all going to be very, very interesting to see how all this synodal stuff uh, plays out. I mean, that, that's the other thing we need to talk about with regard to the McElroy essay. I know that uh, we're running out of time uh, with regard to McElroy's stated belief that the Synod is going, to, as you said, is going to talk about issues that we thought were settled, like women's ordination and yeah. homosexual sex uh, and other sexual sins, divorce and remarriage. We thought these things were settled. And right. McElroy point blank says, no, these are not settled and we need to right. keep talking about them. So that conjures up two things. Number one, well, didn't Pope Francis say that this is exactly what the synodal process is not going to be? It's not going to be a super parliament voting on various doctrines. The other question I would have for Cardinal McRoy is then what is your when is a doctrine settled? What is your view? What is your hermeneutic 
of the tradition. And that's that's a viable theological question. What is Cardinal sure. McElroy's views on uh, the indefectibility of the church, the continuity of the tradition, the authoritative weight of magisterial statements? That was the elephant in the living room. Uh, I mean, otherwise, what's he saying? That, well, none of we, we don't care about any of that anymore. That's all just silliness. Now we're just going to start voting like modern yeah. people voting yeah, yeah. on all these things. Yeah. So I don't know. What do you think? No, I think you're, you, you've you touched on something I think super important here. And I think this is where we go back to kind of something you said earlier, or maybe I said, I can't remember now, but um, a lot of times it looks like you're, you're, you're changing little issues. Um, like, oh, you know, what's the right. big deal with ordaining women? A lot of Catholics would be like, why don't we ordain women? I, I, I get, you know, they're sympathetic with that. What's and the then big then deal maybe, with circumcision? Yeah, exactly. No, that's right. Right. But, but, but what is at stake is in order to get your way on these issues, it also is going to result in an entirely different quote method in theology. You're going right. to have to, you're going to have to sociolo- sociologize the church. You're going to want low ecclesiology. You're going to want a very low theology of revelation, right? You're you're going to want heavy-handed yeah. historical critical method and historicism of the traditional sources. I mean, so you see, it it comes with a whole. Pack. It's like it dominoes. It's like yeah. you said. It's like you said to me in a meeting we had a couple of weeks ago, where you said. Issues that start very, very small. Yeah. Then unra- it's like pulling on a thread on a sweater, right? And the whole thing unravels. Like in the Reformation, they're saying, okay, well, we don't want any works righteousness. We right. don't want grace to be anything other than utterly gratuitous. So none yeah. of our works adown- redound to our salvation. Yeah. And you yeah. think, well, okay, let's talk about it. And then you, that <laughs> yeah. requires a whole different yeah. church. <laughs> yeah. That requires a whole different church. That's exactly right. And a mentality goes with it. That, that This is something else that I, we were talking about with the Andrew Willard Jones book in my last class. Um, in order for Luther's soteriology to work, he has to utterly <clears throat> juxtapose in a dialectical way, the inner man and the outer man, faith and works, um, the temporal and the spiritual, which then plays right into his politics, which is the absolute domination of the temporal order over everything. Because spiritual yeah. power has nothing to do with this world, Larry. It's all other, you know, it's, you know, That's right. so, so you end up with an absolute he- hegemony of German princes, their power. I mean, the poor peasants revolt and Luther's like, kill them. Right. Oh, um, yeah. The, the, and and he lost accidental. a lot. Of, he lost a lot of face. <laughs> yes. In that. Yeah. yeah. It was not accidental to his th- theology that this would be the politics that he would affirm. Right. So so you're, what you're showing is that these little issues sometimes seem to be isolated. But in fact, they, they come with a whole package deal. And that's right. why the liberal Protestant churches don't just have gay marriage. They also have a pluralistic theology of religion. They have low Christology. They have no ecclesiology. Um, you know, it's pure democracy. <clears throat> yeah. All, it all goes together. Nobody wants yeah, to admit and, it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. and they, they have contraception. They have abortion. Uh, yeah. I, I'm sure that there are many Anglicans that are just straight up Unitarians. Uh, right. They've always had that tendency anyway. But <laughs> Salvation by taste alone. Larry. No, yeah, well, it's yeah, funny. I mean, yeah. the Anglicans are actually holding the line better than the, quote, Episcopalians in the States. But that just shows you how far the mainline churches here have gone into the culture. I mean, if you're if you're more left than British Anglicans, you're pretty left. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean they're, they're out of communion, right, with the Anglicans because they're so progressive on on these issues, and because yeah. they because they ordained practicing homosexuals and made women bishops, I think they lost communion with the Anglican Church. They did, and uh, it's only going to be a matter of. I mean, <clears throat> you, you you talk about the decline in Catholic attendance at Mass in German Catholic churches. Right. The Protestant churches are even worse. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you have like say 10% of Catholics on any given Sunday are attending mass in Germany, the Lutheran attendance is about 2%. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. so there's, there, as I wrote somewhere, there's a control in this synodal experiment and it's called <laughs> Protestant churches in Germany. There's a yeah. control. All right. Yeah. And that control doesn't make the synodal process promising. Right. And that it, it or, goes back to, Yeah. So go ahead. Sorry. Go. No, no. It just and that goes back to what McElroy said. You know, well, the Senate, we need to talk about all these things. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather not. Right. It goes back to something we said earlier that I think just, again, has to be reiterated. 
the trajectory of liberalism is always in one direction. That's right. Which proves that it's not dialogical. That's right. It, it's, 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 it's progressive by nature. In other words, the spirit is always heading in the same direction, according to a liberal. More greater emancipation, greater freedom from the past, from tradition, from nature, from God, et cetera, et cetera. That's the trajectory. There's no, there's nothing in a state of act that can that can measure this thing. And that's why yeah. you don't want to talk about truth and you don't want to talk about good, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's it true. has to be open-ended. Yeah. Yeah, and, and ultimately, so so very much the, the the silliness of it all. I mean, as I said earlier, they 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 want to, and I and I mean when I said it, it's so stupid, because they really do think. I, I honestly, Hauser, I think that liberal Catholics really believe that if we just change the church's teachings on all of these hot button sexual and gender issues that we really would suddenly bring the young people back into the church. We would stop alienating. And I just find that so incredibly dumb, so naive, so superficial, so lacking in any profound. Have they never read Charles Taylor, Carl Truman? I mean, any of these, I mean, it's actually talk about the church always being 10 years behind. How about a hundred years behind? I mean, we, yeah. we, there are, very astute observers, both Catholic and non-Catholic and even non-believing, who have yeah. pointed out that the trend of the modern world is away from transcendence, away from God, away from religion and towards yeah. an immanentized transcendence. If there's any God concept left at all, uh, right. utterly privatized, utterly secularized, that this is the ethos of modernity. Newman was writing about it in the 1830s. Cyril sure. Regan had a great article in Catholic, uh, in the Church, Church, Church Life Journal. Uh, I, I've got it somewhere. I quote it in a few places where he quotes Newman from the 1830s talking about modernity represents, you know, what the French call an entirely different mentalité. It's, yes. it's not just a different, a different opinion on these issues. It's yeah. an entirely different way of thinking. This is what I meant earlier when I said liberals simply accept the plausibility structures of the New York Times as the yeah. really real. This is Newman's yeah. point. Modern right. people simply swallow a, yeah. a completely different ethos from that yeah. of the church. And right. yet the liberals continue to think that the issue is not disbelief, it's not secularism, that, that people will flock back to church if we just have gay marriage. Yeah. Well, I think two things, Chap, in response to that, because I think that that's 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 exactly right. What what you're saying is that liberalism is a competing Catholicity. It's right. A, With a, a different it, priesthood. And entirely different things that you believe in. And 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 I think the reason that, that that some people don't see that is because liberals can affirm certain Catholic teachings. Well, of course they can, <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that, I don't know, the sky is blue. Catholics believe that. Okay. So liberals, so therefore, you know, they're compatible. Jesus was but, important. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Right. But obviously it's precisely what it rejects about Catholicism, where you find its fangs coming out. Right. And, and, yeah. and that's, so, that, yeah. so that's, the thing. but I think actually what has happened is there, there, there were a whole bunch of people remaining in the church because the council gave them hope that the church would be liberalized. Those people are, are, are inc were getting increasingly frustrated, right? Because their hope was that eventually the church would turn into the New York Times. I don't think they do think that we're going to get full pews um, when, when uh, we liberalize the church. I think they know the church will kind of go away, but I don't think they care. I think they kind of right. think, well, then we just merge into the New York Times and who cares because that's what we've wanted all along. I almost think these people will the death of the church in an institutional, it's, it's going to be now a church of the people. Yeah, you know, I think you're absolutely right there, actually, Hauser. I stand corrected. This is where my case falls to the ground. <laughs> no, I just, uh, I no, just, no, no, I think you're absolutely right. You have just said something I think absolutely brilliant. It's not, it's, and well, this then explains away the, the naivete element here. It's not that they fully expect that if we just change our views on these things, people will come back to church. Yeah. It's just they don't give a damn about the church. Right. They know that it's dying and going away. And they what they want is simply secularity with Jesus sprinkles on top. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, an utterly secular ethos. And so mm -hmm. they, they're actually 
either overtly or not or, or implicitly willing the death of the church. And actually, yeah. were there not in the heyday of the 60s and 70s, all of these sort of death of God theologies? Yeah, the that secular saying, state, right? That yeah. actually sec is secular Harvey Cox. Yeah. That secularism is actually a creation of Christianity, and yes. it is the full flowering of Christianity. Absolutely. That Christianity creates liberalism, and yeah. thus Christianity has had, had it already from the beginning an right. inbuilt an inbuilt eschatology of self-dissolution and ultimate irrelevance. Yes. As the message of Christ simply passed into the world as a leaven in the form of secular liberalism. I yeah. think you're I think. I think this nails it. I think you're right. I think that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah, it's it's brilliant, chap. It's it's like because it, it, we're we're ending on a note that I think is super important, and that is that what these yeah. people embrace, and this is why Cyril O'Regan wastes so much of his time writing about Hegel. People are like, why do you write a book this big on Hegel? Well, because this is precisely it: is that liberalism is the end of history. <laughs> it's the goal. It's and, it's, it, yeah. and it's a joachimist uh, view of the spirit that the yes. spirit is. It, it, right? It's, it's Joachimist. Uh, yes, exactly. That it's well, the, to the my listeners, Joachim of Fiore, who had this sort of yeah. eschatology. Age of, of the spirit. A, yeah. age, the different ages of the church, the age of the father, age of the son. Now we're in the age of the spirit, which is free yeah. flowing. Yes. And it's going to be basically the church morphs into liberalism. And then it's the church of the people, finally. And we don't have the big, bad hierarchy. Well, and the reason why I made my comments, though, about uh, many liberals thinking that we just change our teachings here. We'll get more people back in the pews because the Germans are talking this way. They're saying, they say well, well, they well, say yeah, yeah, we're going to we're not going to be relevant. McElroy, we're not going to be relevant exactly. uh, to you. We're losing young people left and right because we're not going to be relevant and we're going to lose all these members. if We don't change our right. teaching. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it's not so much that they think people will flock back. It might be just a sort of rear guard action to say, can we at least stop the blood flow? Yeah. Uh, because I think I don't know if many of them consciously really do want the church to simply end. Uh, I, I think they want some semblance of church to continue. They, they want some, paid. they do. <laughs> yeah. They want the church tax, right? They, 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 they do want some explicit Christians to still be around, I guess. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, to keep the, the, the dangerous memory of the radical Jesus alive. Right. Can I just say something? Well, final thing then about sex, like we started out kind of talking about sex stuff. Yeah. And then we should probably wrap this up. It's one yeah, thirty. I got, I, I got to take my dog out and go to the dentist. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So in that uh, order. Yeah. yeah in that, in precisely in that order. Yeah. But um, it, it was precisely the one of the, the things that, about pagan culture that Paul and, and, and the rest of the apostles were worried about was how badly the sexual culture of the pagan world treated people. I mean, you know, I mean, right. it was it, right. it, it was awful, right? Well, the sexual revolution is not exactly being friendly to people either. I mean, some of the stuff I've been reading lately, I, I'll get on my Google newsfeed. I don't know where. I think I read this in the New York Times a while back. Um, apparently, millennial couples, I may have mentioned this on a previous uh, podcast, mm -hmm. with you, are increasingly in what are called sexless marriages. Oh, yeah. What that, what that means is that they're having sex fewer than five times a year. OK, now these are these are people in their 30s. I mean, you know, right. So this this doesn't sound right to me, <laughs> but but it's porn. Um, porn yeah, well, it's, porn. Well, and they finally get around to say, well, one of the factors, is, you know, here it is. Right. They're saturated with pornography. The Japanese are, are increasingly the young people are not interested in having sex with actual people because right. they have other ways of you know getting their dollies and stuff like this. So isn't this funny, like the sexual revolution, which is to liberate us for more and more fun sex without any guilt, has basically liberated us to not having any sex. No sex um, at all. And it'll be soon be the case that only Catholics and Amish people are still having sex. Um, <laughs> I mean, real as, as Jean-Luc Marion once said at a faith and reason thing, we went to pretty soon <laughs> Catholics are the only ones doing it the old fashioned the old way. The old fashioned way. Yes. He said uh, that in well, you know, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the thing is, too, I just read an article yesterday I, I don't remember the source but it was reputable the, there's been a survey done in the united states of, of young women i think mostly you know high school and college age young women yeah one third one third have mental health issues oh yeah deep, yeah. deep depression right. and suicidal yep. ideation one yes. third yeah. one third of american young women but i thought secularism was supposed to liberate us and this is your right. point Yes. One of the things that the McElroy's uh, and Supich's of the world don't seem to understand, don't get, 
is that secularity is not benign. It is right. highly destructive. It yeah. destroys everything in its path. Yeah. It just absolutely destroys everything in its All path. All values this way. They're, everything gets this. The sexual know? revolution has been largely destructive uh, and not constructive. And now we have an entire epidemic of young people with suicides and depression and mental health issues uh, right. because they suffer from spiritual exhaustion. Yeah, and they have they have nothing, absolutely right. nothing in their lives to lift them out. Hey, but anyway, um, hey, this has great been great. It is uh, we've been talking now for about an hour and 15 minutes, almost an hour and 20. So that's great. You got to go to the dentist and to my viewers. I, I'm sorry. I haven't been on the blog very much. I've been traveling. I've been giving talks. I'm heading out tomorrow to Chicago to give a talk to some word on fire people. I'll be back on uh, Thursday. And then I am done traveling for another month. So I'll be blogging more and so on. So thanks again, everyone, for uh, paying attention <laughs> for this hour. Now I have to, uh, let's see, end this sort of thing, uh, stop recording and uh